Oi, an exactly solvable model for emergence and scaling laws. This one was pretty cool. So LLMs can exhibit rapid on a log scale transitions where they acquire the ability or skill to solve a new task as the number of parameters, training data set size, or amount of training time is scaled up. This phenomenon has been dubbed emergence. Um, the big thing being uh, that rapid transition thing. It'll just, even though the loss curves decrease smoothly, it'll all of a sudden just have a new ability um, almost out of nowhere um, in that time scale. So the loss improves predictably as a power law in the number of data points or number of model parameters or simply in the amount of compute on a problem. Such a phenomenon are called neural scaling laws. Power law is just the type of speed we're talking about that we observe um, and neural scaling laws uh, a while ago, Google uh, derived how quickly this happens on a predictable basis over the course of many or as meant of actual scaling the system. Um, Mike Hod et al. introduced the multiple unique sparse parity problem where tasks are distributed in the data through a power law distribution of frequencies as a proxy for studying emergence and neural scaling in LLMs. For this data set, the authors were able to empirically measure and schematically derive scaling laws as a function of training steps, parameters, and training samples, T and ND respectively. They also directly observed the emergence of new skills with increasing T, showing how smooth neural scaling laws can arise by averaging over many individual cases of the emergence of new skills. The key point here is that um, the tasks in the data are distributed according to a power law distribution, uh, hence explaining why uh, the skills show up in a power law distribution as well. Um, and that just the effectively what it means is um, uh, I'm not going to get too into power laws per se, but uh, every uh, new skill the LLM has to learn is significantly more rare than the previous skill it learned, hence why it has to take in so much more data just for those skills to even show up in the data. In theory, if you had the perfect curated data set, then you could have models train much more quickly um, based off and have them learn the skills basically all at once. If you had an even distribution of skills of like the most common skills showed up, barely more common or equally as common as the rarest skill, what we actually have is every successive skill in the order of how rare they are um, is way more rare than the last. Not slightly more rare, way more rare than the last. Uh, throughout this work, we consider the infinite data regime such as the optimizer, uh, such that the optimizer only sees fresh samples at each iteration step, and there is no distinction between training and test losses. This contrasts with the grokking phenomenon, which also exhibits sigmoid shaped curves, but is related to a discrepancy between the model's train and test behavior. So, grokking is when uh, it's only been shown consistently on synthetic tasks, only happens under certain hyperparameter settings, but basically, uh, the model uh, will get very good at memorizing the data sets uh, and then with so very high test or training data set accuracy and then still bad test data set accuracy. Test data is the data that's been held out that has not been shown to the model during training. And then eventually, again, this is in um, uh, log scales, right? But eventually, very quickly, the model in a delayed manner, all of a sudden eventually learns um, a, a pattern that actually does generalize to test data and allow for, allow for high test accuracy, right? So that is a separate uh, thing to what's happening in the assumptions of this paper. In this paper, um, they are uh, assuming the infinite data regime, um, meaning that's, uh, which you can also can do in grokking experiments, but the grokking experiments, their data, their data regime usually involves one single task. We can actually see the thing. So grokking is in one single uh, synthetic data task. There have been a few examples recently, I think, of grokking being shown in weird data sets, I believe. I'm not confirmed on that. Um, but in this infinite data regime is much similar to language modeling, not perfectly the same, but um, in theory, we have so much language data available that it wasn't until very recently that we were actually training on um, all the data available and even still like you go to a certain um, a certain LLM model company and they are not using uh, the data the language data that is proprietary to a different company Microsoft probably has a ton of word documents over the years saved that we don't have access to that's Google, Google can access kind of thing that Google cannot access um, 
uh, the fact that it sees fresh samples at each iteration step uh, is not quite a perfect matchup to our current language model training though. In reality, the internet contains a lot of copy and pasted text, so that is a bit of an issue there, but it doesn't actually affect this paper per se. Um, we represent skills as orthogonal functions and measure their strength in a model by calculating the linear correlation between the model output and the skill basis function. So a simple um, a function uh, would just be a, uh, a corresponding to a skill, right? Um, any skill that you want to learn, it's just a set of inputs and a correct set of outputs, right? So if you if I give you these things as inputs, can you properly give me the correct output? So can the model learn the correct function? And we design this data set such that we create a bunch of orthogonal functions, meaning functions that are not related to each other, right? So that uh, the model has to just successively learn each function individually. There is no way for it to learn one function and have that transferred to a different function. So we're getting very clean, discrete units here. Um, it is probably the case that at the most base level, at least I would assume, like I would, feels, feels correct, that the actual real world tasks are also orthogonal and that um, the, and whereas when you think of generalizability, that would be compositional tasks. That's when you combine orthogonal functions uh, into uh, new uh, kind of superclass functions, right? And combining them together or just doing them in sequence, back to back, stuff like that would, would create generalizability, um, compositionality in your actual um, performance. Uh, you, you might, we might have s skills that are not orthogonal, um, but even then, that shouldn't break this study, I don't think. Um, if this is just a simple test case, I would say. Uh, and if real world, real world skills not being orthogonal, I guess that sounds reasonable too. Um, although I have a feeling that if you were to just break things down further towards their simplest possible pieces, there will be a lot of orthogonality at least. Uh, the number of skills... Uh, follow a power law distribution, said that earlier. Uh, the target function is a sum over all skill functions. We're just defining the actual experiment here. Um, I think it's an experiment, maybe it's just a theory of derivation. I forget which, honestly, this paper was read a while ago by me, not, not recently, um, but basics of the setup, um, skipping the over the actual complex math. And we experiment with a two layer fully connected neural network with relu activation. So very simple setup, easy there. Uh, the dynamics of the multilinear model are decoupled and each skill strength shows a sigmoidal growth in time. So the model is learning uh, all the skills separately and according to how you would expect, which would be a sigmoidal, um, a sigmoidal shape. Note that, which is the, which is the same thing you see uh, generally in accuracy curves. Note that skills with lower frequency have more delayed growth. So in theory right here, um, we look at these uh, growth of, or accuracy in the skills over time. That's an oversimplification. They're actually doing a different metric called skill strength that I'm not familiar with, but I'm pretty sure this roughly um, works out to where this blue skill is the most common one. It gets learns first, and once it does start learning, it learns quickly, hence the steep slope. And then this green skill is the rarer of the three, so it takes a lot longer for the model to learn, and once it does start learning it, it does so more slowly. Um, and you see this uh, separation in uh, tiers of when they get learned, just based off the model prioritizing, because the loss function says I'm loss function says I don't care which one you learn, just learn them all. And given frequency-wise, uh, the model naturally uh, is inclined towards probably, anyways, learning the blue one first, just because it's so much more frequent, so it has a larger effect on the loss. Under suitable assumptions, uh, for example, we take uh, the data set size and I think number of parameters uh, uh, approaching infinity for uh, the scaling law over training time. We can use uh, the above equation to derive how the law scales with respect to uh, training time, uh, data set size, number of parameters, and C, what was C? Oh, compute budget, sorry. Yeah, of course, compute budget, um, which is a limitation on uh, how much of the other three that you can use, right? Anyways, they derived an equation that uh, 
lets them predict the actual uh, loss uh, given this very general system and that in theory uh, if if the actual real world data does in fact correspond to their model then we should be able to use this equation to uh, as the base to re to replicate um, uh, Google's chinchilla findings would be the idea although in reality the actual distribution match up perfectly maybe not but hopefully in theory maybe um, what do we have here? The learning curve, so loss is here, it's mean squared error loss of the multilinear model is uh, the solid lines and the respective power law dotted. So dotted is what they should be getting in theory. And then uh, solids what they actually find when training for their experiment. Pretty close matchup right here. Um, here we have uh, time scaling, what you'd expect, data scaling, parameter scaling. Uh, they're all just roughly symmetric to each other is my impression. I haven't bothered to, deep to, to dive too deep into it, but you can see from the curves at least, same idea. So summary of the scaling laws, the leftmost column shows the bottleneck of the scaling law. The middle three columns show the resource values in terms of the bottleneck, either taken to infinity or proportional to the bottleneck. And then the last shows the scaling exponent for the loss as power law of the bottleneck where alpha plus one is the exponent of the power law, um, power law distributed input data. So each one of these things can be a bottleneck, time, data, parameter counts, or compute counts. Um, you, you can, for some reason, be limited by any given one of them. Time, obviously, you don't want to run forever. Got to release your model at some point. Data, it's just how much data is available. Um, this paper does not get into quantity, or sorry, not quantity, quality. It assumes just a given uh, level of data quality and we have been finding data quality to be a actually big factor recently um, so I think future models are going to have to find figure out some way to separate out data quantity and quality I don't know how that would be done um, parameter counts really a parameter count wouldn't be limited directly it'd be more so be limited indirectly from computes but whatever and then compute uh, is just measured by your size of your um, GPU cluster or whatever um, and so they say, all right, if time is the bottleneck, right? Hold time constant, let data and parameter counts go uh, infinitely. But there is an implied, um, there is an implied compute limit based off the fact that we have a time limit. Um, let's say if data is the limit, right? Time can be, you have infinite time. Uh, let's say your data is the one that's actually stuck. And if you have uh, data restriction, you actually can just train forever, and so there is no implied compute limit for this one, um, no derived compute limit. And last one is uh, your parameter count. You can, let's say if you're, the thing limiting is parameter count, which would be odd, I guess that roughly, but not quite correspond to like a limit in your total amount of RAM available, kind of, sort of, um, but yeah, kind of. I mean, there's other trade-offs you can make in terms of the actual model size, like, like switching out attention blocks or MLPs kind of thing. But roughly, it's like equivalent to RAM limits. Um, uh, so assuming a uh, parameter count limit, infinite time, infinite data, um, here's the parameter count limit, and there is an implied compute limit based off of the fact that you're limiting your parameter counts. Um, and then these are just the relevant the relevant exponents that would go um, that we would be fitting with our curve. You know that how Chinchilla derived those actual um, exponents and everything. These are what we'd actually be um, matching up to and measuring if we were to redo Chinchilla with uh, with this theoretical framework. So our model requires only one sample from the kth skill to learn such a skill, similar to how language models are few shot learners at inference. This this section, uh, I didn't get too far into the math in here. I kind of started skipping over. I thought it was some cool observations, but it wasn't quite up my alley. So I just gave us the takeaways, and I'm not going to pretend to understand how they got there. But basically, somehow, they have derived... Uh, a few shot learning um, and in this extreme theoretical case it's actually one shot learning um, I imagine this is having something to do with in context learning uh, and because they did say that it's relevant to future learning and inference um, but I don't know exactly how this math of this works I did not get too far into it um, but apparently uh, if you had this perfect theoretical scenario um, it, they have uh, shown the ability to do one shot learning which is really cool not just few shot learning
Uh, and then here in these graphs, we have a trade-off between parameter counts and time exists for a fixed uh, level of compute. Smaller uh, parameter count trains faster, but plateaus after learning all of the skills while a larger oh, n skill. So the actual number of skills is limited and equal to the number of parameters. That's interesting. Um, so n skills, while larger n, larger parameter count, can achieve smaller loss at a slower pace. The dotted lines show the optimal loss for a given compute level, which follows a power law. So dotted line, compute level power law, um, all these different horizontal lines, that is when a model of a given size, of a given number of parameter counts, just plateaus because it is fitting all that it possibly can into its parameter count. Um, hence why we love overparameterization. Note that the solid lines plateau after intersecting with the dotted lines, indicating the optimal allocation of time and parameter count for a given level of compute is to have the time just large enough to fit um, n number of skills, aka the same number of skills as you have parameters. So really, really cool little curves here, I like this a lot. Um, and then these alpha values are just, I think, different scaling speeds for based off the system. Like if you had by chance um, found different chinchilla scaling parameters, uh, you might roughly, can you, can you relate to those to data quality, like the alpha maybe? I don't think so, I don't know. Um, I will notice that it's not a perfect matchup here, like for example, in this blue one, they were a bit above right here and a bit below right here, um, which is interesting. Uh, I'm wondering in terms of like what size model did they use in everything, what's happening here? How did they get below this theoretical line? Um, maybe the model that they've derived here only takes into account monosemantic neurons and these are getting to be very polysemantic, I, or I don't, I don't know, that doesn't sound right either actually, that doesn't sound right, but who knows? Um, uh, in section five, the previous section, we derive the data scaling law with the model's single shot learning ability. One shot learning is only possible because the model has GK as an orthogonal base. I think GK is the definition of a skill maybe. Um, so orthogonal basis in its skills, meaning the skills are all unrelated to each other. Um, neural nets without GKs as a fixed basis must discover GK, which requires multiple samples from the kth skill. So if you do not have an orthogonal basis um, for your skills, then it actually takes more work to uh, separate out from different skills, which is interesting. I would have thought it'd be easier if they were not orthogonal, but I guess that actually makes more sense, is when you have skills that are kind of related, you now have to worry about separating out which one is which, is my rough impression of that, although we should probably figure out what for, for sure what GK is. Yeah, so uh, it's just the basis of the skill functions is labeled as uh, as GK. All right, that's fine. That's, that was easy. How far are we? There we are. Oh, all right, almost done. This paper established an explicit setting to investigate emergence by presenting skills as orthogonal functions, we proposed a tractable multilinear model with the skill function GK as the basis that shows the emergence and scaling laws. In our multilinear model, the skill functions as basis functions decouple the loss. So each skill loss evolves independently of the others. As a consequence, for time, skill learning dynamics are decoupled. For data, they depend only on that specific skills observation. So that is an overly perfect simplified model. It does sound like they said a second ago that in real life, um, skills probably are not so well decoupled, so orthogonal, and that that does in fact, it said increased training time, I think, yeah, increased training time. Um, Given the importance of GK in our model, especially in decoupling the skills, it is puzzling why our model can describe emergence in neural networks, which lacks the GKs as the basis, lacks the orthogonal basis. Neural nets with the ability to feature learn will eventually fit the target function, but it need not learn each uh, orthogonal skill in a decoupled manner. Um, they can actually learn them in a combined manner because they're not orthogonal um, and take advantage of that maybe, or, or make it be worse from that, I'm confused. 
We speculate that the significant differences in the skill frequency, um, aka the power law distribution, prompts the neural network to learn the most frequent uh, skills with limited resources, and uh, an effective, which is an effective decoupling of skills. That was pretty cool. As you can tell, I didn't bother with this one to actually go super in depth. Um, theory wise, uh, I'm not super concerned with uh, actually having to know this. Uh, the, the takeaway that I liked from this paper um, was that insight of like, so right now we've been seeing, uh, don't get me wrong, the curves go up exponentially, models get better and everything, but in reality, like to make the models better at this linear rate on the benchmarks, um, what we've had to do is we've had to like exponentially scale the amount of compute, right? And it seems like the explanation for that seems to be, uh, at least from this paper, that the reason uh, or the assumption is, um, and they use this assumption to then get a model that was roughly close that seemed like it might correspond, uh, they was that the the skills in the data set show up according to a power law, like a long tail uh, distribution for how rare the skills are. Um, and that makes sense. I mean, look at uh, looking at language data in general, you would in fact expect um, like the uh, crazy complicated weird tasks are probably pretty rare. Um, then the basic tasks are probably overwhelmingly common kind of thing, hence power law distribution. And it's just a cool explanation for why uh, we are having to scale up data size uh, and, and model size correspondingly so much um, to get these linear um, results uh, in our uh, performance. And it really does demonstrate how, like, um, to a certain extent, uh, we cannot continue off of the, the current dynamic, um, like, unless you really just want to, like, put in trillions of dollars on the same internet data over and over again. I really think that, like, given that... Uh, scaling up to like Sam Altman's 7 trillion number and everything. Don't get me wrong, like it'll work to a certain extent because when you scale up that much, you can now take the super rarest of skills that were in the internet data and run the model through the internet multiple times and it will be able to pick up on those rarer skills. That was part of the uh, insights here. And that's cool. But uh, what I think we're going to actually have to do um, and that will be maybe even faster to do is curating our data set better is um not curating per se not like data cleaning but like collecting data better and i'm working on that right now um is a, a way to get much more information dense uh data sets um we'll be talking about that hopefully sometime this week or next week is my goal um indirectly though i won't say it but i'll have a video that will or a few videos maybe that will if you know what to look for you'll be like oh wow that's that's what he was talking about kind of thing Anyways, uh, if you enjoyed this, like, subscribe, comment, YouTube things, join the Discord to discuss with other tuna dorks. Um, if you'd like to support me financially, you can hit the join button or the link to my Patreon down below. I'd very much appreciate that. Thank you to people who already are supporting me. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I guess end of video.